We are now in the podcast exclusive part of my chat with former BC Premier Glenn Clark. Glenn, this has been an honor, a privilege. I really appreciate your time. Great to be here. Nice. Thanks for asking me. You don't do a ton of media. I do hardly any. Yes. I feel like you would be great on a political <laughs> panel, I, on an economic panel. No, I mean, I don't want to alienate anybody. We're running a company here. We don't want to take sides on issues or try to be <laughs> try to be Switzerland as best I can. But. No, fair enough. And, and I can understand that. I want to talk about BC politics. Sure. I, and now that we have a little more room to breathe, mm -hmm. we have this arena where we can talk about things a little more. You can sure. throw some shade if you'd like at anyone. <laughs> Let's go through the BC parties, right. the, the major BC parties, and you sort of tell me about their their challenges that they're facing, sure. and, and I'll set you up with each one. So BC Greens, let's, let's start with them first. Will this ever be a true mainstream party, or will they always be like an advocacy party or a potential kingmaker in a close election? Well, to a great extent, it's up to them, you know. But if you look around the world, uh, there's green parties that have done quite well, mm -hmm. uh, usually not forming the government, but, but being part of a government or a coalition government. So there's certainly uh, proven around the world that there's a role for green parties. But I think the challenge is, of course, that a, a single-issue party, uh, or predominantly single-issue party, even if that issue is something as existential as climate change, is really challenging because mm -hmm. people people have their lives and they're and there's all kinds of things that government do and government programs, and so as long as they are dominated by an environmental agenda and to the exclusion of everything else, yeah, then I think they're doomed to be a, a pretty small party, even in an important time like this. Uh, I know they're constantly trying to talk about other things, but I think I think it, the problem is at their core. They are an activist or, or uh, almost an interest group party, driven party. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, you know, it's pretty easy for me to say that because it's it's also true that that climate change is uh, 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 so important that it overwhelms lots of other issues. So yeah, I get. It's that. a bit of a paradox, it's right? A bit of a paradox, but I think I think that's the challenge for the Greens. They are because they're so focused on that to the exclusion of everything else it's very hard for them to break through in a bigger way. Right. Now, I really like their leader, the BC Greens leader, Sonia First Snow. Mm -hmm. I've, I've called her the philosopher queen. I think she's really great on social justice issues. Mm -hmm. For a two-person opposition party, I think they were punching above their weight. And, and I don't think they get enough credit for being as influential as they are in terms of things that the media brings up. It's usually mm -hmm. you know brought up by the Greens and then kind of filters through the, the, the media. But yeah, I, I just wonder... Is it an organizing thing? Because it's, you know, the Greens often get slammed for being very white. Right? <laughs> they are. They and are. it just feels like they haven't yeah. broken through a lot of these communities. So I wonder if that's their main I, problem. I think white and urban. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that is part of the problem, I think. But I do think, by the way, I just want to um, disagree a little bit about their sure. influence. See, when, I, when there was no real Green Party, or at least not a big Green Party when I was running, all the Greens were in the NDP. Mm. And the NDP had a very strong green ethic. The Green Party actually dilutes that in a way. You know, when, when the Green Party t took away, like Sonia first of all was a member of the, of the NDP, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. When they left that group, I don't think that that enhanced the environmental challenge or the environmental uh, agenda in British Columbia. I think it actually hurt it. Yeah. Because I think uh, when certainly when I was there, the tension inside the NDP on the green question was enormous. You're constantly trying to to balance that, you know, industrial development, green issues. Yeah. And I think um, so. I don't know. I, I just think being pure on the green side, um, you know, kind of meant that it's more marginalized than it would have been otherwise. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think what I meant when, when I say influential, and I think you you are absolutely correct. What I meant is that when when people were talking about uh, data transparency around COVID, when the certain issues were brought up with drug poisoning oh, deaths. Sure. I think they were coming out of the Green Caucus and then they were not not feeding in a direct way to the media, but they were kind of informing media of like, here's some you know great questions right. to, to ask right. the government. So right. that's what I meant in terms of influence. And that's fair. I mean, you could argue that the Liberal Party opposition was poor. <laughs> and, yeah. there, and therefore they filled the vacuum that should have been by any opposition party, but yeah. they are an opposition party. I, I have nothing but uh, positive things to say about the two of them. Anybody that runs, you know, especially for a third party, I think deserves credit sure. for standing up for what they believe in and arguing their view. And, and, and certainly the two members do that all the time regularly, and that's positive. 
Let's talk about the BC Liberals. Right. What challenges does Kevin Falcon face in bringing this battered brand, battered party back to its former glory? Well, an old politician one time said that being in government is like having a backpack, empty backpack when you start. And every year that goes by, they put a big rock in the back <laughs> of your backpack. And after about 10 years, you just collapse under the weight of all of the problems that it build up over time. Yeah. And I think that's just the biggest problem, first of all, is they have a legacy of being in power a long time. Yeah. And with a lot of uh, baggage. Yeah. And I think that's one of the challenges for Kevin Falcon, who, who you know, they didn't go for somebody new and younger. Mm -hmm. They went for somebody who, who carries all that baggage. Now, maybe if he's really strong, he can carry that big backpack to victory. But he's got a lot of um, things to be held accountable for. And, of course, the NDP's challenge will be to to talk about those things. And his challenge will be to talk about the, the, the rocks that are now in the back of the NDP <laughs> incumbents. But I, so I think they have some challenges with that. They have some challenges with, with what I would call renewal. Mm -hmm. They're not, um, they don't have many visible minorities. They haven't done the outreach. They uh, have a lot of older members. They need, they need a renewal is yeah. what's happening. And, and, and Kevin Falcon, I think is a unique challenge for renewal because he's, he's not really part of, He's trying to be the renewal force, and he may well be able to do it. But he, of course, has been there a long time, so that's a bit of a challenge. Do you him. think they're facing an identity crisis in terms of this coalition between yeah. federal liberals and federal conservatives? I mean, we just saw John Rustad being kicked out of caucus for yeah. uh, not even commentary that he made, but retweeting and, yeah. and sharing a you know, climate change denialist post or Yeah, or it's always a, co it's a coalition, as you know, between yeah. liberals and conservatives. Um, I think it sounds to me like uh, Mr. Falcon wants to— you know, be closer aligned with the conservatives, which would, you know, which... With the conservatives, you think? Or yeah, I think with the conservatives. I okay. Think, federally, because um, if you look at British Columbia, let's face it, it's basically mostly conservative federally with some NDP, a bit more liberal nowadays, but mm -hmm. historically it's been the two parties have been conservative, not been a big liberal presence, federal liberal presence right. in British Columbia historically. And so that the liberal party has been dominated mostly by conservatives in that, in that, in that coalition. Not because... They're trying to dominate. It's because that's the majority of the members. Yeah. And uh, so, I, I, I mean, I do think there's an, there, you know, he's talking about rebranding the party as a different name. I think those are probably positive things to do for them. But I wonder when you rebrand your party, I mean, there is risk in that, yes. right? So people, you have to reintroduce yourself. Yeah. People might not recognize you on the ballot. You know, folks who vote but uh, only were paying attention for the last couple yeah. hours. So you're like, yeah, yeah. like there's there's big risk. It, it's not just like oh, you start fresh. Sure. It's it's you really in some ways you start from zero in the sense that uh, you have to introduce yourself to the public, right? So is isn't there a big risk where suddenly they might lose some built-in? Oh, my parents always voted BC Liberal. Oh, but they're not on the ballot. I don't know who to vote for. Uh, now. You know, they'd have to answer this question, but I, I don't. I don't know if the risk is that big. I mean, they're they're winning a lot of rural British Columbia. They're likely yeah. that's likely to continue. They don't win in the Lower Mainland very much. That's where they need to. Well, break. especially in the last election, and that's yeah. What, yeah, especially in the last election, and that that's where they need to break through. So uh, if they can if they can start fresh with a well organized. Uh, ethnically diverse party with a bunch of new young people, mm -hmm. um, I think that probably is a smart strategy. Easy to say, hard to do. Yeah. I mean, they, um, and I think uh, fundraising, uh, thanks to the John Horgan government, you know, the, the um, financial rules are terrific in my view, but they, but they limit the ability for someone to buy an election or a political party. Right. And most conservative parties historically have raised money from business and maybe relatively few businesses raise a lot of money. They can't really do that now. They have to raise it from people. So I think that's a good thing. And it also means that they have to appeal to people. And yeah. uh, if they can do that, then they'll do fine. In the current climate that we're in, yeah. doctor shortages, yeah. uh, the economic climate with housing, as we've we discussed on the TV segment, isn't it sort of prime where they can just hammer at the BC NDP? Hey, you guys were in power for five, seven years, whatever it ends up being. These things have gotten worse. Yeah, you can. But I think the public's a bit smarter than that they have, <laughs> in the sense that they have to look at, uh, OK, what are you going to do? Yeah. And uh, and they have to shed some of that baggage from the past. Mm. So uh, but you're right. They, they, they're an opposition party, so they should oppose. And that's and uh, and they're doing that. And I think probably Kevin Falk can be more effective than they've been in the past. He's uh, he's been around. He's a clearly capable guy. Um, 
But I do, I mean, one of the challenges we have in Canada and in British Columbia, and one that I worry about, is not really so much the polarization as the inability to talk, mm. you know? Sort of like, you know, um, elites, liberal elites, if I can put it that way, or university educated people in Vancouver, they think people who, vo- who you know, who voted for Donald Trump or maybe Pierre Polyev, um, they're dumb. Yeah. You know, they're just stupid. Wow. Yeah. Oh, they must be stupid, you know? And I think people who are in um, rural British Columbia, they look down at, at sort of university educated people in Vancouver and they say, well, they're not doing anything for me. They're not helping. They're not, they don't care about me. And there's, of course, as always, there's elements of truth to both those caricatures, sure. if I put it that way. But I think we've never seen, I've never seen in my lifetime that kind of intensity where, where people don't, don't listen at all to yeah. the to the options yeah. or the debate. They, they immediately pigeonhole somebody in a certain way. And not trying to understand right. the pains that people are going through. Absolutely. And you see it. I mean, I someone showed me this uh, this flyer that Heidi Fry had sent out in, yeah. in her community. And Heidi Fry obviously has been in her office for a very long time. Very long time. But it was all this positive stuff that the the liberals were doing and they were just they just said, you know, how could anyone ever vote for this? This isn't yeah. speaking to yeah. my community and the pains that my neighbors are yeah. facing and the challenges we're facing right now. It's all it's everything is great. We solved yeah. COVID, yeah, we're yeah. doing great. And I think you're absolutely right that when you have that type of frustration right. Uh, and you completely ignore it. It, yeah. it. it actually deepens those that polarization and the, that divide. Yeah, I think the trucker convoy is the best example, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I can easily criticize that. I mean, that's easy to criticize, and and sort of the media, everybody, oh, the whole country was appalled at that. Yeah, uh, and and I get that because I I was kind of appalled too. But it's more important to me is not to say you're appalled, but to look at why. How did that happen? Like, why are people that angry? Yeah, and what's going on in their lives that they're so angry? That they're prepared to do that, to break the law or to go to Ottawa. And I and I think we don't we don't analyze that question enough about why are people so angry and and how can we deal with that and how can we speak to that? And uh, there's a great danger as uh, population growth in urban areas, depopulation of rural areas, closures of sawmills, etc., that we really have uh, two Canadas, you know, a north yeah. a, a sort of rural Canada and urban Canada, and with 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 nothing in common, yeah, and uh, and nobody talking about it, and it's hard to talk to because in the social media world, you you talk to only the people who think like you, sure. And the media has become less significant in because there's so many choices now that yep. people can choose from. So that would be my worry about politics generally, both in British Columbia and Canada. So sticking to the BC Liberals, because this is where we sort of started this conversation. Do you feel You're bringing that, me back? To I that. am, yeah. <laughs> but do you feel like, and this has always been my criticism. I, I, I do think that Kevin Falcon is a very competent leader. I think sure. they have some interesting ideas within their, that party. They have some interesting caucus members as well, who I think can be future leaders. But my criticism has always been that when they come out with their comms or their plans, it just feels out of step with British Columbians. And a great example is, you know, Premier Horgan announcing the uh, the cap on rent increases. Mm-hmm. And you had some BC Liberal MLAs come out and say, this is going to, you know, hurt land landlords yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And it's like... Sure, there is that argument, but you know, read the room, guys. Like no one is, no one is really looking out for those guys at this moment. Yeah. People who have, you know, a second or third property that they're renting out and have been doing well and yeah. are getting renters to pay their mortgage. So, do you feel like, or do you, would you agree or disagree with me that part of their problem is that they they just haven't hit the pulse yet of where British Columbians are? I don't know. Part of their problem is they're conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's a supporting landlords is a time you know a long. You know, honor, honorable tradition of the Conservative Party of Canada and of British Columbia, or Liberals, or whatever. But wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't someone who is politically astute go, yeah. okay, even if we think that, we shouldn't say it yeah, out loud. Of I agree. <laughs> no, I agree. No, it's uh, it's dumb, and it's uh, you know, I think they have kind of lost their way a little bit. You know, they've been in power a long time, to be fair. Yeah. And they haven't had that kind of cleansing yet, really. They they thought I think after they lost that minority government. They thought, oh, that was a fluke. We'll just hang on here for a couple of years. And they were so close, and, and right? We'll get, yeah. we'll get back in. Yeah. And so when they got beat pretty badly by John Horgan and the NDP, then I think that really set them back. And then, then, and then what do they do? You know? yeah. So they haven't, I don't think they've quite found their footing yet. But they're definitely, obviously, there's good people in the Liberal Party working hard to, to change that perception. 
and maybe they'll get there, maybe they won't. What do you think will define Premier John Horgan's legacy more, being the Premier during the COVID-19 pandemic or kicking BC Liberal ass? <laughs> which one um, Which one do you think will define him in 20 years when uh, we're talking question. about him? I think um, the latter. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, his biggest legacy for me is getting rid of money in politics. Yeah. I tell you, that is so democratic, Mm -hmm. you know, because certainly for years and years and years, uh, too many, you know, big business, and I guess you could argue unions as well, but organizations throwing lots of money at it, like we see in the United States, it's obscene in the United States. Yeah. To have restrictions and to make sure that it's it's relatively small donations from individuals is revolutionary, really, for democracy. And really, I think, a good. It actually forces the parties to try to raise money from individuals. It means they have to speak to them. Yeah. Not, by the way, to big business or landlords or unions or anybody. They have to speak to the average person to, to raise money. And, to, and, and of course, as you know, we know, money is the lifeblood of politics. I love how you're saying this as you run a multi-billion dollar <laughs> conglomerate. <laughs> well, because... Um, no, I appreciate the yeah, frankness. I'm yeah, not... Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's because... Well, I, I, I think... Um, Business is business, and civic, civil life is civil life, right? There's, yeah. There's, there's, there's not a um, – um, it's, it's, you know, even when I went to work for the Jim Patterson group, people said, well, how could you do that? You're an NDP or Well, I have a mortgage. You have to work, <laughs> right? I mean, people have to work. Yeah. And uh, I don't think it you, – you check your politics at the door just because you go to work. I mean, everybody has to work. Totally, yeah. In, in talking about how – you know, this BCNDP government took money out of politics. Does the prospect of PACs, political action committees, yeah. worry you? We saw this story. I mean, it was yeah. it was kind of a backwards pack, but, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Chip Wilson had some money behind it, the Pacific Prosperity Network or whatever it was. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, this is now going to be the future because we've taken money out of political donations. So does that worry you at well, all? Well, it, it does a little bit. I mean, people will try to game the system, I'm sure, to their advantage, mm-hmm. particularly money. Uh, so we have to be vigilant about that. At the same time, it's a free country. We can't say sure. you can't talk about issues. And Chip Wilson, Chip, has every right to 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 be very vocal about his view, and, mm-hmm. and I think that's great. Um, but we just don't want people buying their way in. Right. Let's talk about the BC NDP a little more. I feel like the the big tent nature of the BC NDP often goes underappreciated. Like everyone says, oh, the BC Liberals are a big tent. But, you know, the BC NDP are, are quite a large tent, right. too. I, I know there's some stuff going on with her candidacy, but I want to bring up Anjali Apadori for a second because I feel like if she does catch fire and she doesn't have to, ca- you know, she's not going to win, I don't think. It's, it's not likely. But even if she gets that media presence and starts talking about the climate a little more, I feel like it will highlight some of these divisions within the BC NDP from, you know, sure. the more centrist side or perhaps the more labor focused side towards the more social justice side, whether it's environment or other social justice issues. Do you see that as, as a potentially trouble? Maybe not just from Anjali Abadori, but even within the BC NDP's own caucus. I don't see it as trouble at all, actually. But, but, you know, since, since I politically left, trouble, well, yeah, <laughs> well, maybe politically trouble, but yeah. no, but I, I, my only point is that, you know, um, it seems to me like there's not enough, um, pluralism in politics these days. Mm. In other words, in parties, they're, they're so so cohesive now. Everybody's toes the line, right? Yeah. And so I think it's good if we have people who speak out on issues that might be, if an NDP member might speak against an NDP policy. God forbid, what's wrong with that? It's but you're not allowed to do that. Well, you should be allowed to do that. We used to do that from time to time. <laughs> Is not, that right? Not, maybe not on the big issues. Yeah. But I think it's, uh, you want to encourage debate. There's not enough debate in my view. It's too, it's too homogenous now. Now, it's easy for me to say I'm not in politics. I don't have to deal with that. But the NDP has raging debates internally on yeah. lots of issues. And th- thank God they do. I mean, I used to hate some of them. But but that's a good thing, not a bad thing for democracy. My goodness. everybody. I think I it's mean, good for democracy. Used, people used to say to me, well, you know, I was a premier. And everything the government did, I agreed with. Well, actually, this is a dirty secret. No, that's not true. There was a bunch <laughs> of stuff the NDP government did that I was the premier of that I didn't really like. Sure. Because, you know, it's not a one, we're not a dictatorship here. You know, we have lots of views. So you try to go to a consensus view on issues. I mean, there are obviously super important issues where the premier does maybe, you know, you know, draw a line in the sand. But generally speaking, um, this is what I think the average person is not in politics doesn't understand. There is a lot of division and debate in every political party. Right. And yes, you see it come to fore in leadership campaigns. But that's, 
I think that's fine. I mean, that's that's part of it. If we ever got to a stage where there was no debate in a, in a political party, then what's the use of the political party? At what point does it not become fine? At what what right. point do those divisions yeah, it doesn't start become, to become yeah, toxic? It, that's what you have to watch. You, obviously, it's more toxic if you don't tolerate it. You know what I mean? Like if you, I think if you right. if you try to stop debate, which people tend to do, then I think it can become very toxic, or people can leave. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you have to do that. I'm not I'm not a naive about it, but I think at the same time, healthy, respectful debate on important issues is really is, is really key. And I think uh, John Horgan did a terrific job of that. You know, there are lots of MLAs who are elected today who didn't support LNG and didn't mm-hmm. support Site C, and still don't probably but are part of the government. And John, because John's style is very respectful and they, they listened and they worked hard at it, they tried their best to bridge gaps, that they, they managed to keep the team together, even though there are people, I'm sure, who disagree with some elements of the government policy. Yeah. So I, I've already brought this up. You were a younger man when you were premier. You were right. 38 years old, which, again, is to me, it's still mind-blowing that anyone in their 30s would be premier, but I like that. When you look at the BC NDP caucus, which is quite diverse, mm-hmm. let's look at some of the younger folks. Is, is there yeah. anyone there that you look at and go, wow, that, that guy is going to be a future premier, that guy's going to be a future leader? We talked about Brad West. Yeah. Brad West absolutely has a chance to be the premier of this province. He's almost perfect for the job, in my view. Uh, but there's all kinds of people that I don't know as well, but there's the, you know, the Bowen Maws seem very interesting to me. There are uh, all kinds of young people, different, diverse people. I, I really like Ravi Callon, who didn't mm-hmm. run this time, but he's still a young man and he, he could run again. No, I think, um, I think it's good. It's, it's about time we had some uh, generational change, actually, in all parties. Do you think it was smart of the BCNDP? I mean, I, again, I'm not saying this was coordinated or, or whatever, but do you think it'll benefit them to not necessarily have a competitive leadership race? Yeah. Or should they have had, you know, Ravi and, and David, f- you know, talking about the issues and, and debating, uh, you know, different positions that you can take in that tent? The answer is yes. It, it, when you're in government, you don't want a divisive leadership race. Right. For two reasons. One is the consequences of victory are too important. You, you're going to become the premier. Mm-hmm. Secondly, um, the government has a record. And the only way you can have a divisive race is if they attack the government's record. Right. And there's lots of other people attacking the government's record. <laughs> well, you don't need the internal debate. Yeah. So I, um, I think in a weird way, um, it's much better to have a consensus candidate move forward right. and to take the legacy of the government. And obviously, uh, if it's David Eby, which I hope it is, um, if it's David Eby, He's going to want to tweak the government's policy. He's, he's not happy with housing. Nobody sh- should be happy with mm-hmm. the downtown east side. Nobody's happy with the COVID impact of, on, on certain things like health care. So he's going to want to improve things in certain areas. But the basic premise of the government, the basic thrust of the government uh, needs, to maintained, needs to be maintained, in my view, and I think the view of most people. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm, what I'm getting from you is the internal debates are fine in private. Right. But the <laughs> public debates are not good. Well, public debates are okay. Public, public debates within it, your own caucus, I mean. Yeah, I agree. That's, okay. that's probably my f- probably true. Uh, I don't mind some public debates too, but they just have to be respectful. Yeah. And I, I, th- I think it's harder and harder to do. I mean, even some of the climate change activists, you know, they're blocking roads, et sure. cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I think again to myself, I say, okay, now, th- they're so frustrated that they feel like they have to break the law consistently and repeatedly to try to make their point. Yeah. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I sound like an old codger, but when, when I was there, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we, we created a lot of parks in British Columbia, like yeah. a massive number. And we worked hard on consensus and we worked with environmental groups and we had trade-offs and we tried to get consensus. And, you know, we were probably, we were more green than, than brown, but, but, we, <laughs> but, we, but we created, you know, 12% of the province in parks. Wow. I don't get the sense now that um, you can do that. Right. I mean, the people blockading the forestry on Vancouver Island, mm-hmm. it, they don't want to negotiate. Yeah. They really feel, and I, again, I try to be sympathetic, they feel ex- this is an ex- existential threat to the planet. Mm-hmm. But it makes it very hard to govern. And I much prefer that we had real debate and dialogue and trade-offs and compromise uh, to move forward. Are the BC Conservatives on your radar at all? I know they've changed their board. There's rumor that John Rustad might jump over 
there as well. Aaron Gunn, a social media personality, is really being influential there. Have they I mean, uh, caught tried, your attention at all? They've tried quite a few times. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, look. Um, they got 12% more, more, in the by-election. And more, more power to them, right? Yeah. It's just that, um, you know, it's hard. I mean, the Greens have done a good job. I give them credit. But again, they may, they may have allowed, they may have such a focus that they could get a foothold, but not the focus means that they, the paradox is they can't then grow the tent very easily. Right. And I think the conservatives are up against uh, a liberal party, which is conservative. So it's hard. Right. Sort of yeah. I just wonder with the sort of populism of Pierre yep. Polyev, if they can ride off maybe, that and, and maybe ride again, the back, a bit. you know, that anger that's out there that we hear and we talked about earlier uh, does give them, I guess, a possibility. Um, and it is clearly uh, something going on that we haven't seen, at least in my lifetime, that kind of uh, intolerance on all sides. Yeah. You're obviously outside of politics now, and, and you touched on this a little bit in terms of what worries you and this mm-hmm. idea of um, – you, you didn't say polarization, but you said being disconnected, the, the liberal elites, you know, not paying yeah. attention to regular folks. But when you look at the current political climate, either in BC or broadly in Canada, you know, do you think polarization is, is a big problem? Well – there's always or are there bigger there's problems? There's always been polarization. Yeah. Are there bigger problems in the political culture? Yeah, it's not it's not the polarization that bothers me. It's the lack of um, of decorum and understanding, hmm. the lack of civility in that debate. In other words, it's always been polarization. I think it's probably not a bad. I probably think, I probably argue it's a good thing. Yeah. But what 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 we're seeing now is um, is a anger fueled by resentment and by lack of reciprocal understanding yeah that worries me it's sort of the under it's not the polarization so much as the as the underlying causes of it and um and i don't it's not i'm not i have no magic answer but i think if you if you're in government you really got to try and pay attention to legitimate concerns you know? yeah and uh and they are legitimate i i do worry about certain labels being tossed around yeah. and i'm starting to see that conservative argument of you know uh, Prime Minister Trudeau being divisive mm-hmm. in some of the labels that he uses, yeah. Yeah. because I'm all for calling out yeah. racism, misogyny, yeah. whatever you see it. But just because someone's conservative doesn't mean yeah, that exactly. they espouse those things. And sometimes you get the feeling that people who are not conservative, they just completely want to blanket conservatives right. like that. Right. And, and the same goes the other way, right? right. Blanketing I, people as SJWs or right. commies or whatever. Right. And it's just not helpful. And to the point where, you know, I, I've had conversations with people that, They'd say, your girlfriend's conservative. How, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. And I go, because politics is not my life <laughs> yeah, exactly. and we have other shared values yeah. beyond, you know, our political beliefs. Right. Um, and yeah, it does worry me. It does yeah. worry me. That you, I, I, you know, I was in a photo with, with Pierre Polyev and yeah. the backlash I got from that. Yeah. And I was just there to support Katie. But even the backlash that I got from that, why would you be photographed yeah. with this person, this Nazi? And it's I like, know. he's know. not a Nazi. Like, right. that's, that word still means something, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's true. I think that's the, and I don't know if it's social media or, or the breakdown of traditional media or the breakdown of a consensus generally in the country that, but whatever it is, it's not healthy for us. And I think we really, anybody who's in a position of leadership really has to pay attention to it. And I, I, I agree. I don't think the polarization is one way. It's, it's, it, it cuts both ways for sure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, the, the danger is that the polarization helps you politically. Like mm. The danger is that the demonizing the other side uh, and firing up your own troops is, of course, a time-honored part of politics. Yeah. But we, we're in a much more dangerous time, it seems to me, right now. I don't know. And I, and I, I don't confess to understand it entirely. I'm a, I'm a privileged guy, so I don't feel, I don't feel that anger. But, boy, it's, um, it's certainly real, particularly in, in, I think, rural Canada when you go around. People feel yeah. – really, they really feel like the government stopped listening to them and is only listening to you know, identity politics or urban people. Right. And, the, and certainly, you know, things like uh, talking about systemic discrimination, whether yeah. it's systemic racism or, or right. sexism or these things, I think these are important issues. But then, you know, you get to that point where because we're talking about systemic racism, blanketing everyone as racist right. is not helpful and right. it doesn't solve any of the problems. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my basic view, just to step back for a second, is if it, the good governments – Take care of what you might call the blocking and tackling, right? The the basics of government. Do a good job of governing for everybody, and then 
once you do that, then you can you can you can get into all kinds of debates about mm-hmm. racism and other issues and, and have legitimacy because you've taken care of the basics. Right. If the government becomes only talks about systemic racism or identity politics or those kinds of things, then that's where I think you run in the risk of um, of alienating people in, in, in North. In other words, if you're doing a really good job in Northern Canada on the issues that they care about. Then when you talk about racism, you they can don't, bring them on board. Yeah, you, you're, stuff, you're talking yeah. about they, they can. But when you're when you're angry that they're not being listened to on basic issues, and the government they don't think is doing a good job on the core issues that affect their life, then I think it looks like you're only talking about the racial questions. Right. I'm starting to see how Brad West is a Glenn Clark guy. <laughs> I tell you. <ya. laughs> There's a guy who takes care of. Uh, I'm, honestly, Absolutely. he got elected by acclamation recently, yeah. which is pretty rare, and it's because he takes care of all the little things. And, oh, hundred percent! And he does such a good job. For I mean, people call it grandstanding, or, or you know, him showboating in the media when he talks about things that are outside of his juris- yeah. jurisdiction. But he does a damn good job in poor Kaputlin. exactly, and that's my point. You see, he can talk about those things because he's doing such a good job. Locally, people are so pleased with the job he's doing. Yeah. It gives him license to talk about broader issues. If he, he only talked about the other issues and was doing a poor job, then he clearly wouldn't be, he wouldn't he, be elected with that. He told election. me this story once, and I, and I feel like I can share it. I've already shared it before, and he, he said it's fine. But he told me about how they implemented a junk collection program. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure exactly how it works. But basically, as you would put out your garbage, mm-hmm. you could also put out an old couch mm-hmm. or whatever. You don't have yeah. to go to the junkyard to, to dispose of it. And he said, you know, he thought this was a great idea and and it would help folks in the community. And the overwhelming amount of praise (laughs) that he got for it, like people were not social, not just social media, but emails and calls. We love this program. This is amazing. He just thought, oh, this would help folks in his community. And and I think what it is, is he's just in tune with the folks of Port Coquitlam, right? And real stuff. Yeah. Not not abstract stuff. Yeah. Real stuff on the ground that makes life better for people. And that and governments all governments could pay attention to what Brad Wall, Brad West is doing in Coquitlam. I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh federal politics before I let you go. It's hard to ignore the energy that Pierre Polyev has generated in his leadership campaign. Obviously, now he's the leader of the yeah. Conservative Party of Canada. Is the political and economic climate ripe for the Conservatives to win back government now that Pierre's leader? Well, first of all, astonishing turnouts. Really yeah. impressive. And so that's not to be trifled with. That's no. really impressive in this day and age. I was in you know, Penticton. I have a place near Penticton and. I think he got over a thousand people in August to a, to a meeting. I mean, it's really impressive, and but, activating people that were yeah. otherwise disengaged. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's very, and I think it's very positive as long as he doesn't um, try to exploit that uh, anger in a way that's uh, I think uh, problematic. But I do think uh, no, I think he's he definitely is speaking to a lot of Canadians um, now. You know, crowd size isn't necessarily. You know, Trump got big crowds as well. Not, I'm not comparing him to Trump, <laughs> but, but but he did, and he lost. Uh, yeah. Tommy Douglas used to get, you know, fill the Coliseum uh, in Vancouver with people, and you know, Dave Barrett would get big crowds, and they never, you know, they didn't win very often. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have to be careful that. But he does have clearly an ama- amazing amount of enthusiasm, and that is no small matter in today's world to for him to be driving that kind of agenda. So. Um, I'm just some of his positions seem so fringe to me that worry me. But if he can, if he can moderate that, I think he, he's got a good chance. Do you think the freedom convoy stuff will hurt Pierre Polyev? I mean, because I think it's also the perception of what most people have of what the freedom mm-hmm. convoy was. And I think you know, in a lot of ways, it mm-hmm. was disruptive, especially mm-hmm. if you lived in downtown yeah, Ottawa. Yeah. You know, it was not a great thing. However, I, I also think it's not fair to blanket everyone who participated right. in one of those freedom convoys right. as a racist or white supremacist or right. anything. Do you think that's going to hurt them? I, I think it run? certainly hurts them with, with the majority of Canadians, I think. Yeah. Uh, but and I, the majority of Canadians did not support it. I think right. 70% yeah. was kind of the polling number But I think that. I, um, I think that what will hurt him more is some fringe positions like um, blockchain and, you know, supporting blockchain or uh, Bitcoin crypto, or Bitcoin cryptocurrency, yeah. And supporting... Um, you know, and saying we should fire the Bank of Canada. You know, sort of, I, I appreciate the anti-establishment nature of it, but they seem a bit uh, fringy and, and worrisome to to that big, broad middle. That he need, Let's face it, how's he going to win? He needs to win some seats in urban Canada. Sure. And uh, because they, they got the popular vote last time, the yeah. Conservatives. And he's clearly better than 
the last couple of leaders. So he's going to do he's going to do well in those areas. But to win the country, he needs to win some Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec areas, and those are those are those aren't um, they're not going to be sold on a, a sort of a, a, a slightly fringy position on those issues. I think. <laughs> I'm trying to be diplomatic. But. Do you think you're allowed? Do you think, as a, a commentator or politician, you're allowed to criticize the Bank of Canada? Because I, you know, I'm pretty mad at Tiff McCallum as well because I think that throughout the pandemic he was signaling that interest rates would wouldn't go up for right. a long time, and I I feel like that misled a lot of people and put us in the situation that we're in. So sure. is, is that a is that fair that you're totally allowed, yeah totally fair? But to say you have to be careful to upend the structures and institutions of. Canada. I mean, we've we've come through. We have a pretty good uh, financial system in Canada. We we didn't have the meltdown in the United States. We've done uh, relatively. It's a very stable country. That's part of our calling card around the world. So I just be careful in cavalierly throwing out. Uh, you know, I'm going to fire him and replace him with somebody. Uh, but criticism, ab- by all means. Yeah. And uh, I just think he takes an extra step. And now he was running for a nomination, and he maybe got carried away. I don't know, but we'll see. Do you see him? Backpedaling on the carbon tax, as we saw Aaron O'Toole do, and a lot of conservatives were upset about. I don't know. He's pretty principled. One, you know, it's you know, your strength's your weakness, right? Yeah. In, in life, and probably in certainly in politics, his strength is that he is aggressive and strong in his beliefs and unafraid, unafraid of meeting with convoy people. I mean, that was mm-hmm. a gutsy move as a sure. politician. So he, that's one of part of his appeal. And so his weakness is, of course, the same thing, right? He's um, uh, got very strong views. And so if he backs off on those views, I think that's that opens him up, I think, to being a phony. So you yeah. got to be careful on that. But, um, yeah, I think um, he's been around a long time, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule him out. He'll be a formidable foe um, in federal politics. He's got a – I think he has a – you know, a decent chance of doing well. I think he's done well in avoiding a lot of the social issues, mm-hmm. which, you know, people exactly. rightfully are sensitive about, well, whether it's LGBTQ yeah. rights or right. abortion or things like that. He's really kind of avoided yeah. discussing which those. Which is more in the mainstream yeah. of, of Canadian view. And and I think it's like, as people compare him to Trump, we, we talked about, I jokingly yeah. said that earlier, I mean, he, I mean, he's not anti-immigration. He's, he's pro-immigration. He's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's not anti-LGBTQ, as far as I could tell. He's quite good on those issues. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or at least good, meaning I agree with him. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, and on other issues. So he's, um, you know, the the trick ha- for the last guy, uh, leaders have all gotten in trouble with that social um, conservative side of the conservative party. I'll tell you one thing he does have, which is really important and more important today than ever. He's got a crushing majority. Like he doesn't owe anybody anything. The That's social true. conservatives or anybody. He yeah. won such a big victory. I think he's got a little bit of a blank slate, and that's, I think, good for him. Yeah. And if you're not on the wagon, you know, get on or, or get yeah, out, yeah. basically, for, yeah. for, the, for conservatives, for sure. Yeah. You know I've been meaning to ask you this, and I saved it for the <laughs> podcast. Maybe we'll break some news. Who knows? But what did your days in politics look like in the future? Is that <laughs> door ajar? Is it open? Well, or is it slam shut? Mo, you never say never, ever in politics. You just don't. <laughs> But um, I, I'll tell you one thing. I wouldn't mind uh, doing some public policy stuff. I mean, I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in the province and in public policy. So, I mean, I could see something doing something. But I'm, elected politics, I don't know. I think it's time for a, a, a newer generation. I feel By the like— way, Kevin Falcon's about the same generation. As <laughs> well, Just saying. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I feel like there are going to be some people who listen to this yeah. and go, wow, this guy's awesome. No, this guy think, should run for office. I don't office. think so. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, I mean, to, obviously I'm, I was very well aware of you, but it was that conversation that we had at uh, Bell Guard Kitchen yeah. where I was just blown away. I, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I didn't really have any expectations, but just being able to chat with you and your insights uh, and the way you kind of look at things, obviously you bring in this wealth of experience, but I would vote for you. Wow. You can run for any any brand. <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, well, uh, there wasn't enough at the end there for me. <laughs> but maybe 20 years of hiatus is good. Yeah, right? That's yeah, good. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Okay. <laughs> How's that? We're just going to use that one sound bite. <laughs> Glenn. Uh, uh, what, by the way, my wife had killed me. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see what the reaction is on this podcast, and then uh, maybe, maybe there'll be some public pressure. Who knows? Glenn, 
you were seriously a dream guest for me, and I really appreciate your time. I know you don't do a lot of media. This was, again, like I said, not just a privilege, but a pleasure. I really appreciate it. I do hope that at some point in the future you'll come back on the show, maybe to announce a political run. <laughs> Thanks, Mo. It's been nice, nice being on here. <laughs> Folks, what a show. What a conversation. Of course, he is the former BC Premier from 1996 to 1999, the president and COO of the Jim Pattison Group. If you listen to the podcast that Katie Merrifield and I did on political panels, we both listed this man as a dream panelist when it comes to politics in the province and in this country certainly no shortage of wisdom current insight and hot takes he's my buddy don't listen to him if he says otherwise he's of course glenn clark and this is van color and i'm omir telling you that in a city where you can be anything be colorful peace <laughs>